right, Three Circle, good morning to you guys. Excited about continuing this series. I also want to thank you. I, I know that this room is absolutely packed right now. And on one hand, that's what we call a good problem to have. But it's still a problem. I understand that. I know that it's tough to get into our building sometimes. I know it's tough parking and all that. We want you to know that we're doing our very best to make that a good experience for you. Uh, but please have patience with us as a church. Uh, we understand that we're going to have to take some steps and figure out what's next as a, as a church for us. Again, good problems to have. I'm excited about this place being full week after week after week and continuing to grow. We're going to figure out what we're going to do about that. But in the meantime, we just ask you to please be patient with us, okay? And understand that you're probably not going to get in and out of this place really fast. So like you might want to make the slow cooker go a little slower at your house, okay? Uh, and, and as you leave, when you get frustrated, you just pray in Jesus' name in your car, okay? But just know our parking team, I mean, all the way across this campus, we have people, including our greeters. All of them are working so hard to make this a great experience for you. Our children's facilities, okay? They're working really hard to make sure your kids are secure and that you're able to come and get them easily. So just please be patient with us. We're just one big family, okay? That's what we are. And we're really glad that God is using our church in the way He is, aren't you? It is something to celebrate. Absolutely. And let me just say that I, I can't tell you what an honor it is to pastor this church. I, I was talking to a friend in ministry this week about how incredible this church is, how incredible you are, our people. And I just, man, I'm blown away. I'm blown away week after week to pastor Three Circle Church. And, and just to think that right now while we are here preparing to worship here on the Eastern Shore, right now at this moment in Thomasville and in Sims and in Midtown, Three Circle Congregations are getting ready to worship. Isn't that amazing? We have a team of people in another country right now doing ministry. Our friend Pano in Costa Rica, who we partner with, is, is right now leading his church in Costa Rica. The reach of this church is unbelievable how God is using us, okay? And we're all a part of that. So today we're going to continue our series on the names of God. And we're learning about God. And, and one thing I would hate to do as your pastor is to just teach you how to be a good person. Okay, because I don't want to make you a moralist. What I want is I want to teach you about God. Because what I know is religion is proven through the ages. Religion will teach you how to be a good person and help you act better. But you may not know God. You may become a moralist and not know God. Okay, But we're a church. So what we want, what I want as your pastor is for you to know God. Because what I know is your behavior will change as you get to know God, right? As I get to know God, He will transform my character and my behavior but not the other way around. So what I want to do, and that's why we're doing this series for weeks, we're getting to know God more because He is worthy of that and because that is our aim, to present God to you so that you would get to know Him. And we just know that that will transform your life. And we've been talking about His names. God reveals Himself to us through the Scriptures with His names. Now the Scriptures are His primary way of revealing Himself to us, and within Scripture we get all of these different names, each name giving us a different angle, giving us a different aspect of His amazing character and His amazing attributes. We've talked about Jehovah, the, the, uh, the primary name of God, the great I Am. We've talked about Elohim, strong creator God. We've talked about Adonai, Lord God whom we must obey. Uh, the last week we got into the compound names of God. And we started with Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And by the way, we got to reflect that last week. Over 4,000 people went through our Compassion International exhibit here. And over 200 kids got sponsored. Isn't that awesome? So we're excited. How many of you got to sponsor a child and you're all excited about that? Yeah, man, we celebrate that, okay? So, wow, God, God's doing some great things. So today we're going to learn a new name of God. And this name of God is one of those names that I think endears us to Him. I think this name, if you can grab onto its meaning, will bring great peace to you, will enhance your relationship with Him, in particular the personal aspect of your relationship with God. This is a name that tells us a lot about God, and it is Jehovah Rohi. Jehovah Rohi, would you say that with me? Jehovah Rohi. Jehovah Rohi. And what does it mean? It means the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And we're going to go to where we find this name in the Old Testament, Psalm 23, written by King David. David knew a little bit about sh sheep and being a shepherd. He had been one since he was a boy. He learned how to be a leader being a shepherd. He learned how to be a king when he was being a, sh a shepherd. Now, to learn about this and to see this name, we're going to go to Psalm 23, which he wrote. And this psalm is one of the most famous <coughs> excuse me, places in the Scriptures. 
a many a soldier has ripped this out of their Bibles and taped it in their tanks as they went into war or folded it up and put it in their pockets as they prepared to go into battle. Anytime I do a funeral, I read Psalm 23 at a graveside because there's something about these words that brings great peace, isn't there? But I just wonder, do we really know the depths of the meaning of these words? So why don't we just read it together, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Lord God, our Jehovah Rohi, thank you for revealing yourself to us in this way. I pray today that you would change us from the inside out as we encounter you in this way. Speak to us, transform us, and Lord, draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, the first phrase of this chapter is really the springboard on which the rest of the chapter is built, and it's this phrase, the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, I'm going to tell you what I'm up to today already. I want all of you to be able to say this. I want you to be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't want anyone to leave here today, or if you're watching online, I don't want you to shut your computer off today without being able to say, The Lord is my shepherd. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the writers of the Bible used great precision. That's why we we hold at this church what we'll call the inerrancy of the Scriptures. We believe that the Scriptures are precise, razor-edged precise. So each word matters. In this phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, each word matters greatly. In fact, let's just break it down a little bit. First of all, David says, the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. What does that mean? The Lord means that there's one true God. I'm going to write that down. Notice he does not say, a Lord. He doesn't say, a Lord is my shepherd. He doesn't say, one of the Lords is my shepherd. He says what? The Lord. That means there's one. That means he is the preeminent, transcendent God. There is no other. And maybe you're here today and you've, you've kind, of, kind of said, well, there's lots of ways to God. Well, the Bible over and over again slams the hammer down in a way. It says, no, there's not. There's only one. There's only one. We're not polytheist here we are monotheist we believe in one God who exists in three persons so David right off the bat says there's not more than one there's only one he is the Lord he's the Lord the one true God and next he uses the word is the Lord is what does that mean it means that he is present notice David does not say the Lord will be my shepherd and he doesn't say the Lord was my shepherd He says the Lord is And by the way, anytime you talk about God, you must use Him in the present tense because we already talked about this. God is not bound by time, right? Now, I don't know if you know this, but you are bound by time. How many of you look in the mirror lately and you go, man, I'm getting a little older? You can see it a little bit, right? Start seeing a few gray hairs, maybe a wrinkle here and there. And you go, man, I am getting... You feel something like, you you know? Used to, I could work out, get up the next day, ready to go. Now it's like, oh, whoa, what was that? Getting a little older, Okay. I'm starting to see 40 over the horizon. Some of you are going, yeah, you are getting old. Some of you are still going, that's really young still, man, you know? All right? I'm bound by time, though. The clock is ticking. God is not. There is no clock ticking on God. He, is, he doesn't have a past or a future. He is always right now. He is transcendent. David, with the precision of the Holy Spirit, gets that when he says the Lord is my shepherd. He's right now. And I love that. I love that we're not talking about some God that used to do stuff. When we talk about God at Three Circle Church, we're talking about the right now God. He is our shepherd. He is powerful. He is mighty. He's right now. And some of us in this room need to grab onto that like David. That phrase meant a lot because David is saying, I have a present relationship with God. Can you say that? Or like many of us, are we leaning on our past with God? Are we here today and we're going to ride into heaven on the coattails of our past? Are we saying, well, He used to be my God. I had an experience with God a long time ago and, you know, I still go to church. I'm leaning on my past when God wants to do something in me right now. 
wants to do something right now in my life. Or many of us may be here today and we may be playing that game that the Bible warns against and we may say, you know what, one day he'll be my shepherd. So right now I'm going to do it my way, but one day when I get this taken care of and I get to this level in my career or whatever, then I will make God my shepherd. And the Bible says not to do that. In fact, the scriptures say that's arrogant. It means that you believe that you have tomorrow. And the Bible doesn't promise tomorrow. Let me just make this real clear to everyone in the room. God doesn't promise you tomorrow. In fact, I might make, not make it through this sermon. And if I don't, one of our staff members, don't worry, will come out and finish the sermon, okay? But if I don't make it, I'm not worried because the Lord is my shepherd, okay? But can you say that? Can you say that? And you go, okay, I've heard this before, dude. I've been in church before. You're using scare tactics. I got you. You're, you're trying to scare me. The next thing you're going to do is tell me that before I get home, I could have a wreck and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, you're trying to scare me. No, 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 I'm not trying to scare you at all. I'm trying to teach the Word of God. The Bible says that life is but a vapor. Okay? How many of you, 10 years ago, feels like it was just yesterday? You go, where did that go, right? Oh, it's clicking on by. And trust me, your life is more fragile than you think. So the Bible says don't act like you have tomorrow. In fact, the Scriptures say this seemingly ominous but also hopeful phrase in the Bible. You ready? It says it like this. Today is the day of salvation. What does that mean? It means now. I mean, don't ever wait to come to God. The moment you're in right now is the moment God wants you to come to Him. Because He is the right now God. And I want you to be able to say that, that He is my shepherd. And then He says, my. Now this may be the most pivotal word in the phrase, my. It means personal. David is saying a lot about his relationship with God. He does not say, the Lord is a shepherd. Because that means that He acknowledges, that would mean He acknowledges that there's a God. He doesn't say, the Lord is a shepherd. He says, the Lord is what? My shepherd. What's the difference there, guys? The difference is, to David... He wasn't just a shepherd. He was his shepherd. My shepherd. Can you say that today? Can you say the Lord is your shepherd? Because David could say that. The Bible talks about believing in God. Jesus said, believe in me and you'll be saved. And many of us, because of the problems with our English language, we believe that that means just acknowledge that he exists. But that's not the word believe in the Bible. The word believe in the Bible has the root word pastuo. That word means to sit in. If I had a chair here and I sat in, by the way, how many of you checked out the structural integrity of the chair that you're sitting in right now before you sat in it when you came in? Did anyone? Because for fun, what we did is we put four broken chairs out there so any moment four of you are about to collapse. I'm totally kidding. But that would have been fun, right? That would have been fun. Some of you right now are going, whoa, is he for real? Okay, no, we wouldn't do that to you. But you didn't check it. So you, guess what you did when you sat in that chair? You believed in that chair. Now, not believe like religion. Don't worry, I'm not going there. I'm saying you trusted that chair. Is that right? So when the Bible talks about believing in Jesus, it doesn't mean for you to go, yeah, yeah, I believe you're real. Yeah, yeah, I believe that you're Jesus. Oh, yeah, you created everything. No, no. Belief has to become personal. That's faith. And that means I sit in Jesus. Or in other words, if Jesus isn't real, I'm an idiot because I believe in Him and have placed my entire life on Him, okay? That is belief. And David had done that, and David says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Personal, personal relationship with God. There's some of you that have been in religious backgrounds that did not teach you that you needed to have a a personal relationship with God. Yet the Scriptures teach otherwise, that you should have a personal, my shepherd. And then lastly, the word shepherd, rohi. Rohi. The Lord is my shepherd. What does this do? This word tells us two things. It tells us who God is, a shepherd, and you're going to see in a moment it tells us a lot about who we are. Okay? It tells us a lot about who we are. So let's talk about who God is first. That's the foundation of all things. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. So let's go to John 10, 14 and hear what Jesus said about himself being a shepherd. Because he was God. So not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament... God reveals himself to us as a shepherd. Jesus says, I am a good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Now let's talk about this for a second. Why did God choose to call himself a shepherd? He didn't have to. He could have chosen other things. 
In fact, let's just go with context. In that agrarian culture of the Old Testament, there weren't only sheep, there were also cows. And I know a lot about cows. I don't know much about sheep. I didn't have sheep, but I grew up in South Mississippi, right across the Alabama line. And a lot of my family lived in Grand Bay, and the other half was in Mississippi, and everybody had cows, okay? I mean, I grew up, my, my life is like a country song, okay? I'm just telling you, George Strait could sing my life, all right? Grew up and miss. Okay, I won't try it, okay? But anyway, I know a lot about cows. And do you know how you make a cow do what you want him to do? You scare him. Did you know that? How many of you grew up around cows or you know all about this? You yell at a cow. Okay? You don't coax a cow to get cows to do what you want them to do. You drive them. That's why when you watch cowboy movies, they, what do they go on? They go on a cattle drive. And do, and do they go out there and go, come on, guys. Come on, let's go. No, no. They're on horses, shooting their guns, whoosh, hitting the whips, right? Ho, ho, all that kind of stuff. Getting those things moving. Some of y'all are like, that's music to my ears. That's how I grew up on the farm. Okay? You drive cows to get them to run away from you in the direction you want them to go. God did not choose to call himself a cattle herder for a reason. The precision of the Holy Spirit reveals who God is to us. And God said, no, no, I'm not a cattle herder. I am a shepherd. And whereas a cattle herder drives the cattle from behind, a shepherd gets out in front of his sheep and leads them. Do you see the difference? Do you see how much this is going to tell you and I about God? The shepherd leads the sheep. Jesus says here, I have a relationship with my sheep. They know me, I know them. Now I promise you there is no relationship really between the cattleman and the cow. I grew up around them. Like I said, they never trusted me. Okay, Because all I ever did was yelled at them and scared them to get them to move on. So I'd stand out there, I remember as a kid with my grandfather, and I'd look at the cows. And they just kind of look back at you. You kind of stare at each other, but there is no affection between the two. And I would kind of do like that, and the whole herd would move. They outweigh me by thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds, but we had taught them, be scared of us, and we're going to make you go where we want you to go. A shepherd does the exact opposite. Shepherds build a relationship with their sheep. Jesus says, they know my voice. Sheep begin to know how their shepherd smells, how they walk, how they talk. They build an unbelievable relationship with their sheep. And this is how God has chosen to reveal himself to us. God says, I'm not going to drive you. Maybe you grew up in a church that drove you, that said, we're going to do this. And that's what religion does. And that's why Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees. Because God doesn't drive you, he leads you, and he's always been out front. The Bible says, while you were yet sinners, Jesus died for you out front. Before you could ever do anything, he doesn't drive you, he gets out front and says, now here's how you do it. Jesus has always been out front being our shepherd and leading us. Aren't you grateful for our Jehovah Rohi today? All right? Jesus says, I'm a, good, I'm a good shepherd. I'm a good shepherd. The Bible says that because he is our shepherd, if he is your shepherd, you shall not want. You shall not want. What does this mean? It means your needs will be met if you want to write that down. Your needs will be met. Not just your physical needs, your deeper needs. Did you know you have deeper needs than just your physical? You have heart needs, soul needs, mental needs. You have something inside of you and God says, I can meet those needs. And by the way, no one else can. If you are, listen, watch this because it's going to help a lot of your marriages. If you are married and you're discontent in your marriage, it may be because you're expecting your spouse to be your God. And people make bad gods. Because if you've placed a weight on your spouse that they are to make your life complete, they can't do that. Only God can fulfill your deepest needs. Jerry Maguire lied to all of us, y'all. Y'all remember that movie? Back when I was in college, that movie came out. You Remember, Tom Cruise shows up. And he begins to talk and he says, You, you complete me. Liar. And she says, you had me at hello. You remember that, right? And for years, that's how guys, every Bubba in Alabama and Mississippi was asking their wives to marry them that way. Baby, you complete me. <laughs> Just doesn't sound the same, does it? <laughs> right? It's not true. In fact, that's why many of us become disappointed. 
Now let me tell you, I love my wife. I love my wife. I do not deserve someone as amazing as my wife. She's better than me in almost every way, okay? Incredible. Makes me a better man. But Nan does not complete me, and I do not complete her. Only God can fulfill the deepest needs of my soul. And when I allow my Rohi to do that for me, I then can actually love and appreciate and cherish my wife the way God's called me to. Because I've not put a weight on her that actually crushes her and that she can never fulfill. Does that make sense, guys? Anything aside from God will crumble beneath the weight of trying to be God. Only God can fulfill. Jesus says, I'm your shepherd. If I'm your shepherd, you shall not want. In the deepest way, He fulfills us. This is one of my favorite passages about shepherds. It's in Ezekiel. And this is God telling the shepherds of Israel how they're messing up. This tells us a lot about God. Look at what it says. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God. Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. Now I love this because what God is doing here is He's given a scathing indictment of the, of the shepherds of Israel. Jesus did the same thing when He talked to the Pharisees because they weren't being good shepherds. That, when, when I look at scriptures about pastoring, this is one of those verses I look at. And let me just make real clear to you guys, okay? Let me just tell you, we're big church, growing church, but I want you to know we are here for you, okay? I am here for you. I am not, so, there, there's no superstars on this staff. The only reason I sit back there is because I'm praying and getting ready to preach. And the worship team, we're all just normal people that got called to ministry, and we're here to serve you. Does that make sense? If you want to meet with me, you can meet with me. You just call the office. I'll have a cup of coffee with you. I'll let you buy me lunch. <laughs> I will. Okay, Well, let me make this real clear. We're here to serve you. If you're here today, you just know we're a big church, but we're here to serve you. We're not here to entertain. Okay, Everything we do is to enhance a worship experience. Just like in the old days they used flags to worship, we use lights. Everything we do is to enhance the glory of God and to point us to Jesus. We're a real church. We're here to pray for you. We're here to strengthen you. You hear what, you, what, the, what the Bible says here about shepherds? I want to be your shepherd and our staff. We want to shepherd you and your family and your kids. We love you. Honor of my life to be your pastor. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here to just stand on a stage. I want you to know that. I'm here to serve you, okay? I'm here to be your pastor. I'm here to be your shepherd. But this scripture doesn't only tell pastors and shepherds how to act, it tells us about God. Because God's saying, This is how I am. I don't drive the sheep, I lead them, and I strengthen and I heal. The gospel is good news. And maybe some of you came to church today kind of going, oh, I don't know, because this is your first time back in a while, and you're wondering if we're one of those churches that's just going to beat you up like the one you grew up in or whatever. And I just want you to know, we're always going to tell you the truth in love, though. Because although there's bad news in the gospel, and that is that we're all sinners and we need Him, the good news is Jesus came and died for us. And the gospel is good news. And there's not a perfect person in this room. And if you've got a bad past, welcome to the club because you're in a room with imperfect people that have met a loving, gracious, perfect God. Okay? That's who we are. Speaking of who we are, let's talk about that. Because if God is a shepherd, what does that make us? <laughs> yeah. So, I like corny jokes. Because I have kids. And I like telling them corny jokes. So I'm about to tell you a corny joke. I would like you to enjoy it. <laughs> what do you get when you have a sheep with a machine gun? A bad situation. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. All right? That's for my kids. I hope you enjoyed that. All right? So let's talk about... I know. It's bad. It's bad. Uh, let's talk about sheep for a minute, okay? The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, it encapsulates the gospel, by the way. Here's a verse in the Bible that has the entire gospel in it. You ready? All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Bad news. Good news. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The gospel in a verse. But it also talks about sheep. And let me tell you, 
While sheep look nice and cuddly, sheep have some serious issues. And that's why God calls us sheep. Let me tell you the four D's about sheep that you need to grab onto today. First of all, sheep are dumb. <laughs> that means I'm talking about us, too, because we're sheep. They're dumb. Sheep will walk in a circle. and One will start and the others will just follow. They are renowned for their lack of decision-making ability. Okay, They will walk right into danger. They will drown themselves on accident. They will starve to death without finding anything to eat. They'll run themselves ragged without sleeping and resting. That's sheep. Just not very smart. And God says, you guys are sheep. Now some of us push back. We're like, whoa, whoa, that's offensive. Well, let me ask it a different way. And let's be honest. How many of you have ever done anything really dumb in your life? Those of you not raising your hands are doing something dumb right now. <laughs> My pastor growing up would say, that's double dumb. Double dumb. All right? We do dumb stuff. This is why, listen, God wants you to understand you're a sheep because sheep need a shepherd. You got that? Sheep don't do well on their own. They need a guide. They need a protector. They need someone who loves and cares for them. So we're like sheep in that way. We have gone astray. We do dumb stuff. We're dumb. We need a shepherd. Oh, we're highly intelligent, but we do dumb stuff. And we need a shepherd. The next D is defenseless. Sheep are defenseless. Sheep have no way to protect themselves. Sheep are defenseless. If a wolf shows up, sheep's dead. Period. Okay? The wolf doesn't even have to think about it. It's not like he has to take a good angle on it, okay? He just walks up and says, Yo, I'm going to eat you. Okay, all right, and it's over, all right? There's another one. I threw it in. Mm, zinger. Okay? So, sheep are defenseless. You and I are defenseless, just so you know. You and I are defenseless against our enemy. The Bible does not say you are greater than your enemy. The Bible says greater is he that is in me than my enemy. Okay? So don't think. I used to grow up with people saying this kind of crazy stuff. We're going to bind the devil and we're going to tie him up and he's not going to do anything and all that. What? No, no. You don't have that kind of power. But God does. So only when we rely on the strength of the shepherd, Rohi, do we have the authority to talk like that. But when I am in Christ, I have power that I do not have on my own. And I can withstand temptation because of my Rohi, my shepherd. And I can be protected because of the power of my Rohi, my shepherd. I am a defenseless sheep that makes dumb decisions. But under the power and direction of God, I become a mighty warrior that makes great decisions because of my Rohi. Because of my shepherd. Does that make sense? All about, all about the rohi. All about the shepherd. Not about the sheep. That's why sheep need shepherds. We're also dirty. Sheep are dirty. Dude. They look beautiful, but let me tell you right now, that wool picks up dirt and parasites. They are dirty. And they have to be clean. Good shepherds clean their sheep. Did you know that? They wash and bathe and clean those sheep. Are you grabbing on to how that correlates with us and our relationship with God? Because at the core, we are dirty, and we needed someone to cleanse us, did we not? How many of you are thankful that your row, he cleansed you when you could not clean yourself? Right? Jesus even modeled this. Jesus at the Last Supper gets on his knees in those old gnarly, dirty feet of those disciples. He gets on his knees and washes their feet symbolizing what he was actually doing for their hearts and their souls. See, every one of us in this room, we're dirty apart from Christ. And we cannot clean ourselves. You can be as good as you want to be. You can be a really good person and you're still dirty in your heart. Because the truth is, even the good things you do often have bad motives. Am I right? So we need a cleanser. We need a shepherd that can clean us. And instead of using soap and water... God took the life of His own Son so that the only thing that could cleanse human beings would be there for us as 1 John says, a propitiation, a payment for us, a cleansing, an atoning, the blood of Jesus, our Rohi. Our Rohi. And then lastly, we're dependent. We're dumb, we are dirty, and we are dependent. We're dependent. We need Him. And when you're dependent on Him, you know what you end up with? Here's what happens. 
when you just embrace that you're a sheep, stop pushing back on that, and you go, yep, I need a shepherd, then the other things begin to disappear. Watch. Because when I depend on Jesus, I start having the wisdom of, of Jesus and His Word in my life. I make good decisions, not dumb ones anymore. And then when I depend on Him, I'm not defenseless anymore because of the power of Christ in my life. And when I depend on Him, I'm not dirty anymore because all is forgiven. And now there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Are you following me? You see how this works? The Rohi, the shepherd. Okay? This is what He does in my life. I'm glad you guys are excited. Y'all with me back there. This is what He does in our lives. And then the Bible tells us where he leads. Let's look at where he leads. The Bible says he leads me beside still waters, lie, makes me lie down in green pastures and restores my soul. Green pastures, let's look at that first. What does that symbolize? Write it down, it symbolizes rest. Most of us would say green pastures and you would think that would be the food, but that's actually rest. Look what it says. It says, he makes me lie down. What's happening is the shepherd finds a good spot, a soft spot for the sheep to lie down and rest because they need to rest. And it says, he makes me lie down. How many of you have children that you have to make go to bed? Like my kids will be flopping all over the house, you know what I mean? And they're crying over nothing. They're just crying. They don't even know why. <laughs> You're tired. No, I'm not. <laughs> You're tired. Go to bed. You know? Y'all know what I'm talking about, parents? You know it when they're tired, right? And then you make them lay down, and like 10 seconds later, they're out. They're just out. Why? They needed rest. And watch this. And you know they need rest before they do, don't you? Is that right? You know what they need better than they know what they need. Your Jehovah Rohi says, I know when you need to lie down. And I love you enough, I'll make you lie down. How many of you know what it's like for God to make you rest a little bit? For God to say, you're going to slow down. I, I've, I've visited people in hospitals that said to me, I'm pretty sure God put me in here. <laughs> so I needed to rest. Or God, God says something to you in His Word that makes you just go, well, I need to stop worrying about that. And I rest. Because he knows what you need more than you do. He leads you. When you go, you're my shepherd. He leads you to lie down. And then it says, by still waters, write it down. This is nourishment. This is nourishment. Notice he doesn't take them to running water. Why? Again, let's go back to sheep being dumb and defenseless. They will drown in running water. So they can't swim. And can you imagine? They're just one big poof of soap. They're like a sponge. You could pick one up and wash an 18-wheeler after it's over with. You know what I mean? Okay? So they drown. Shepherds know they can't handle running water. In fact, one thing common to shepherds in ancient times is they, if they could not find still water, they would go to moving water and dig out a trench and allow the moving water to run into a place where the sheep could come and drink. Now do you see why God calls himself a shepherd? Watch. Because God gives you what you need even when you don't realize what he is doing. He's giving you what you need. He'll allow things in your life that you don't even know you need that you need. Okay? And He's going to nourish you with what you need. And He knows what you need. My kids would eat gummy bears and chocolate milk for every meal, every day, forever. And they would die if I let them do that. Am I right? I know they need other stuff. And I make sure they get it. You're Jehovah Rohi. Make sure you get what you need, and then you have restored soul. What is this? This is trusting in Him. When I trust in God, it restores my soul, the deepest part of who I am. When I stop pushing back and worrying and being anxious, I become centered in Jesus. I want that for all of you. I want that for me on a daily basis. Because I'm going to be a better dad and a better husband and a better pastor, ready, when I... Trust in Jesus, right? When you trust Him with your job, you're going you're gonna to sleep way better at night. When you trust Him with your health, when you trust Him with your finances, when you trust your Rohi, it restores your soul. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've experienced this, right? Something happens when you go, you know what? I trust you. I trust wherever it is you're taking me. I trust you. It will restore your soul. And then the Bible says He leads us to paths of righteousness. This is direction. He'll tell you where to go. 
Now be honest today. How many of you really need some direction in your life? Like right now, you need some direction. You need to know what God wants you to do. He promises He will. He will show you where to go. Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. That means acknowledge you're a sheep and you need some help. And the Bible says He will direct your paths. He will direct your paths when you do that. Okay, so acknowledge that you're a sheep and you end up with all of these benefits of having a shepherd. Hey, let me just tell you, having a shepherd is a good thing. Having Jehovah Rohi is a good thing. And he says here in Psalm 23, I walk, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Understand this, God does not keep us from valleys. I think we're real clear on that at Three Circle. God will let you suffer. Know that. You'll walk through valleys. But he walks through them with us. And let me just say this. Better to be in a dark, scary valley with Jesus than be up on the hillside without him. Agreed? We have a couple who's going to India, gone to India. They're there now with their beautiful daughters, and they're starting an orphanage. I had lunch with my good friend, Jacob, who's doing that. And I asked him, I said, man, are you worried about that? Dangerous place where your kids and all. And he looked at me, and he said, and I'll never forget it. He said, Chris, he said, it would be far more dangerous for us to be in Fairhope, Alabama, in disobedience than to be in India obeying God. How about that? That's a sermon right there. Okay? Because we can trust Him. And then here's what I want you to learn about having a shepherd. When you're in those dark spots, instead of focusing on the shadows of life, focus on the shepherd of your life. Instead of focusing on the shadows, focus on the shepherd. When I was a kid, I used to hunt a lot with my grandfather and my dad, who I idolized, both of them, just amazing men. And, and they seemed fearless to me. And, and especially in the dark, we're in the woods as a kid, Every tree is a bear. Do y'all know what I mean when you're a kid? You're like, every tree is a bear. That's a bear. That's got to be a bear, right? That's a wolf. So I would get so afraid. But I used to learn, I can still in my mind, I can still see my dad in front of me and me watching his boots and just focusing on that. And man, it would make me feel so much better because I'd remember my dad's right here. My dad is here. I'm not worried about anything. That's my dad. Okay? You're going to go through times where you are terrified in life. Okay? It's going to happen. And I would say to you, in those moments, because you are a child of God, focus on your shepherd. Focus on him, listen to him, talk to him, draw near to him, get right behind him, and follow him. Okay? Follow him. Because he is going to take care of you. Even in death, the Bible says, there's no condemnation for the believer, and even in death, there is no sting for those of us who believe in Jesus. Okay? That's how far... This goes. 2 Corinthians tells us that God is able to make all grace abound and that you'll have all sufficiency in all things at all times. You hear that? All sufficiency in all things at all times. That means that in your time of need, your Jehovah Rohi will lead you. He will. And you may not even think you can handle it now, but you'll be able to then. I lost my grandfather a year ago. I thought this will wreck me. For years, I dreaded it. And when he got sick, I thought, I, I am not going to handle this well. Because I didn't have the strength I needed then. But guess what happened when God decided to take my grandfather home? He gave me strength. And it was tough. But my Jehovah Rohi led me step by step by step by step. And he walked me through it. And he gave me grace and strength that I did not have, watch this, until I needed it. And he'll do that for you. That's who he is. So God is more than enough. God is more. Let me say this over your life today. Jehovah Rohi, more than enough, right? Listen to David. He anoints my head. My cup overflows. He is more than enough. And as you focus on that truth for the next few moments, I want you to experience this. Check it out. Rich and poor alike, listen with your His love is for us all. His love is for us all. Oh, rich and poor alike, listen with your own soul. Do not. 